Well, welcome folks to the week following the fifth Sunday after Epiphany on February 7th. And as we come towards the end here of uh, this Epiphany season, we uh, start to get into some maybe kind of uh, nasty stuff we would consider, but also some very exciting stuff. And today we'll have a couple different stories, but uh, invite you to begin by thinking about your highs and lows of the week. Um, what is it that uh, really was a good thing and what was a more challenging thing this week? Um, and then what I'd like to do to you, do for you here, like I said, there's a variety of kind of highs and lows in our readings this week. So I hope that they um, relate to your highs and lows. And I'm going to just uh, take these readings kind of one at a time. There's about four of them here or three of them. And um, let me just take the reading. I'll do a little talking about it, and then I'll go back and do another reading, talk about that uh, before we get to the end here. So we begin in Mark chapter 6. Uh, we're in deeply into Jesus' mission and ministry, so things are going to start to change here a little bit. And we begin with verses 1 through um, 6a. And uh, let, me, let me read for you. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he, Jesus, began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they looked and they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometowns and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Wow, now all of a sudden we have unbelief by the people. But this is a special group of people. These are the people in Jesus' hometown. And uh, I don't know if any of you are still living in your hometown. I know I'm not. Uh, I don't know if I really want to live in my hometown because um, I know a little bit too much about some of those people. You know, I've heard congregations say, you know, well, we sponsored this person in seminary. They should come back here and be careful what you wish for because remember they they know you and um uh, you know them in a different capacity so could they really really be your pastor um would that would that be a good thing uh isn't it much better to send them out somewhere else but um isn't that strange how we will you know speak to a stranger and tell things that we would never tell our hometown or our our family but notice the struggle they have they are you know who is this guy you know this is that jesus carpenter's son mary and you know, we all kind of wondered about wondered about uh, his his background story and uh, here he is telling us all this stuff he never went to rabbinic school um so there is there becomes that unbelief that doubt that how could this possibly be so maybe uh, we should be reminded that uh, faith is, is sometimes best when it's new, or belief is sometimes best when it's new. Uh, maybe our old, our old ways of understanding aren't necessarily the best ways. And uh, Jesus, you know, this great line, you know, prophets are not without honor except in their hometowns or in their homes where people know them really well, know whether they, uh, you know, pick up their socks or put the dirty dishes in the, in the sink or the dishwasher. Um, so some fun things to maybe kind of play with um, in your own life about uh, how you're perceived at work versus at home, uh, in your hometown versus where you are at 
I was just thinking of that today. I was uh, I lived near the uh, town where our governor is from, and so I've heard stories about our governor that maybe many of you have not heard about. But <laughs> that's for another day. Now let's get to some kind of exciting stuff here. The mission of the twelve, beginning with verse six b. Then Jesus went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and to not put on two tunics. He said to them, Where, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Wow, the disciples now get to take part in the exciting stuff of mission and ministry. They get to go out and proclaim. They get to go out and heal. They get to go out and drive out unclean spirits. Oh my, they've been watching Jesus do this. Now they get to do this. And notice they go two by two. And in the Jewish tradition, you needed two people to witness. So by having two people who would proclaim the same message gave it a much greater validity. And that idea with the oil, oil was used as a way for healing. You know, when we do healing services or we anoint people with oil, we talk about anointing. That's just that idea of uh, creating that special connection. And they are to go not all prepared. Literally, they're supposed to take the shoes on their feet and the clothes on their back and go. Don't take a purse and depend upon the hospitality, which is a big thing, hospitality of the people in that community. And you stay in one place. You don't keep hopping around. You know, whoever welcomes you first, that's where you stay. And when you leave the town, you leave. You leave. And if they don't welcome you, um, there's this bit about your shoes. You take your shoes off, take the dust off as a reminder that you, since they're not going to take anything you have to give, you're not taking anything from them. Um, so uh, kind of exciting. The 12 get to go out and do this ministry. And notice it's just the 12. Um, no other followers. Mark is focusing on that group of 12. And you wonder, who got Judas? Who got Peter as a, <laughs> as a traveling partner? That would be a whole other interesting book. And finally, the death of John the Baptist. This is one of those insert stories we're going to have here. And so I invite you to listen for some of the details in this. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against John and went wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard he was when he heard him he was greatly perplexed and yet he liked to listen to him but an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee when his daughter Herodias came in and danced she pleased Herod and his guests and the king said to the girl ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it and I will give it and he solemnly swore to her Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the Baptist. 
Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought him his, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples, John's disciples, heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Hmm, my goodness, three stories. Talk about high or low, high, low. We have the whole bit here. Um, but this story of John, uh, John, we were, we were told earlier, was the proclaimer, the predecessor to the Messiah. And here's an, a, a different understanding that they thought that John had the spirit. So if John was this great proclaimer, by Parrot thought by putting him in prison, that would quiet things down. But as we've heard several times, Jesus' fame spread. And for Herod, he thought, oh my goodness, the spirit of John the Baptist has been put into someone else, into this Jesus character. And isn't it interesting? Some people said John the baptizer. Some said Elijah. He's a prophet of old. So people recognize that he is, that Jesus is some sort of prophet. And when I read this, I thought, ah, the original, the first, well, one of the first royal scandals we have. Herod had basically taken, we're not quite sure if there was a divorce or not, what happened, but uh, he coveted his brother's wife, the brother Philip, who was the uh, leader of the Decapolis, which we had a couple weeks ago. And uh, for some reason, Herodias thought Herod was a better match, had more power. We're not quite sure why. But um, John was very vocal in saying that, you know, that's wrong. You you shouldn't uh, be have your your, your uh, brother's wife, especially if your brother is still alive. You know, it's the opposite of the Levitical laws. If your brother were dead, fine, but your brother is not dead. Um, and um, notice how Herod, even though we're told is troubled by what John says, he still wants to hear it. And isn't that interesting how, you know, sometimes we hear things that trouble us and we know it's right, but, oh, it's going to interrupt our life so much. Why? But there's something about the right, the truth that draws us in. And in this case, you know, Herodias, the wife, is uh, looking for an opportunity to get rid of John the Baptist. And we had also been told that soon after Jesus was baptized was when John was arrested. So, um, John has been sitting probably in this prison for quite a while. Um, and uh, Herod keeps coming and he keeps talking to him. Any opportunity he has, maybe this is where the uh, a lot of stories from Acts begin where the disciples get thrown into prison and they use that as an opportunity to teach. But um, Herod is having his birthday and it's a wild and crazy party. And Herod's probably had a little bit too much drink to drink, not a lot of sleep. And we were told his daughter, okay, so he's obviously been married to Herodias for a while, and the daughter's name is Herodias. And here is a royal princess dancing, and it's probably a rather dance of the seven veils type thing. And I couldn't help but think of that young girl last week, the girl who was Jer Jairus's daughter, who was raised from the dead, I'm guessing that this girl would probably be about the same age. And uh, look what happens to her. She is used as an object of, um, of showing power. And she becomes the, um, we know she doesn't have much sense because, you know, oh, you know, whatever I'll give you, dad says, I'll give you whatever you want up to half my kingdom. This, this sign of, this symbol of generosity and she's like, oh, what should I get? What should I get? Mom, what should I get? And mother's like, ask for the head of John the Baptist. And notice she goes back. She wants it on a platter. So at least maybe she got the platter out of the, out of the deal. But just the sheer almost comedy yet tragedy of 
this story that it takes um, this young girl as a being used as the intermediary to uh, result in John's John's death and beheading was the merciful way of someone being executed versus crucifixion which is a long and slow and painful so John if nothing else was given the royal um, execution of uh, of being beheaded and we're told then these the disciples of John come and take his body and laid it in a tomb so these three stories I invite you to maybe take one of them again one one every two days every other day and read them once or twice you know at least twice just to get an idea of uh, hearing again and again you might uh, see things a little differently so uh, let us pray Heavenly Father we know that there are People in this world with whom we have uh, disagreements, may we be more like the disciples who are willing to come open and in need to share your word to people that are starving for it, crying for it, instead of pushing people away and using whatever means they have at their resources to eliminate the truth help us to see that the truth is what sets us free holy god you sent many into the world to proclaim your kingdom on earth send us equip us and walk with us so that everyone can learn of your abundant love amen and our final step is the step of blessing and you bless one another if at all possible when you're together and children love to do this and we're reminded that Abraham was told by God I will bless you so that you may bless others so it's part of our covenant at our baptism we are marked with that cross of Christ to remind us of the promise God made to us through Jesus to bless another is to share God's love and promise with your voice and with your touch. Each week I'll supply you with a blessing or you can basically just say, Jesus loves you. Beloved of God. Anything like that. And like I said, let children bless others. And today I invite you to make the cross and say, send us to share your word. Amen. Have a great week, and next week is one of those turning points. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.